This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways in which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. Hello and welcome. Really, I'm alive. I promise I'm live today and barring any other technical difficulties, we will be having a wonderful show. So I hope you hope you will enjoy tuning in. And with apologies, I took a little literary license and call How Clean Is My Coal? I read the book How Green Is My Valley years ago about a Welsh mining village and I said I have to pay homage to that. But before we get into the debate about clean coal and isn't it really an oxymoron, I have some fun things to share with you and I've been waiting all week. So first of all, Norway has embraced the electric vehicle revolution. I mean, the Norwegians, the Scandinavians in general have always been sort of clean and they've really been pushing sustainability because they're islands and frankly, they need to be very prudent with their resources. So Norway has been pushing EVs and they sold about 800 new EVs in Norway last year. And um, they think that they won't be able to buy any internal combustion engines after 2025. But guess what? They can't find EV charging stations for the users of the cars or the drivers. And now they actually have a hard time finding them even when they're going on trips. So apparently in the summer, the weekends, Oslo empties out and they all go to their cottages in the Norwegian fjord area to recharge their, you know, their, their, their minds and to relax. But apparently recharging their electric vehicle is a little more difficult because the exit ramps are lined up with EV cars waiting to char- be charged. One store employee had had to learn how to help her frustrated customers in addition to learning how to flip burgers and sell um, snacks. She said that sometimes they get so frustrated we have to give them a coffee to calm them down. Now, Norway, coffee is very, very important. But apparently a a country that has embraced EVs has not yet embraced a charging system that makes sense. I'm wondering if this is a sign to come. And And then another media outlet that was going to write a positive, important article about the need for EV charging stations ended up writing an article that was actually really describing the hellish ordeal they had of driving the Kia from Detroit to um, Florida. So what happened was this the uh, journalist who wrote it basically said um, that they, she started the trip and they wanted to drive 1,500 miles from Detroit to Florida in the dead of winter. But she was so afraid that the EV charging station wouldn't be, there wouldn't be enough of them that they didn't even turn on their heaters in winter in Michigan because they would drain the battery. Well, I don't think that sounds like a very nice way to start a car trip. They had to stop 12 times and the stops recharged uh, required up to 55 minutes. So they had to spend time waiting in their car. So it added another five hours. And as I've said before, if you've ever taken a road trip with little children, stopping at a gas station for more than 15 minutes is a challenge. Stopping five hours over a drive of 1500 miles would be impossible. I don't know how much licorice or TV games you could give them to amuse them. So and it sort of unintendedly told the truth about the EV charging station, which isn't unique to Norway and is not unique to the United States. And it's actually a really big problem that no one really seems to be talking about. And then, you know, last week or so, two weeks ago or so, I talked about methane and how we, you know, methane is supposed to be an evil, bad methane greenhouse gas. Well, guess what? Scientists in Sweden, again, my Scandinavian ancestors, discovered a giant crater that has been created from the Ice Age explosion. Now, that's a long time ago. And it has been spewing methane in mud inside a mud volcano. Now, it's been spewing methane for millennial, millennia. Still, we're not dead yet, okay? You know what's happened? The ocean explorers discovered in the Arctic this underwater volcano that was been spewing mud and methane inside another larger crater that was formed after the ca- catastrophic blowout at the end of the last ice age. Now we're talking lots of time ago, like millions and millions of years ago, this has been spewing methane. Researchers spotted the unusual features about 80 miles off Norway's coast. And they found though, 
they just started exploring it and they were all excited because the new methane is like finding hidden treasures. And they, uh, the Arctic University of Norway, um, in the co-leader of advancing the knowledge of methane in the Arctic. I just love this. But anyway, they actually found that a submarine meth mud volcano was a geological structure that's been expulsing muddy fluid and gas, methane, for thousands, millions of years. And guess what? It's being controlled naturally because guess what happened? Nature is at work. The researchers found that the volcanoes are teeming with animal life, feeding off the carbonate crusts the, of the minerals that have been formed when the microorganisms consume the methane and produce bicarbonate that formed thousands of years ago. Okay, so now we have a methane spewing mud volcano that's supposedly very lethal and very deadly and we have to be worried about it. And guess what happened? Nature came over and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So now there's organisms that actually eat methane. Who knew, right? Eat methane and guess what it's done? It's created a whole new diversified reef, reef of new life. They said that they've seen sea anemones, sponges, coral, starfish, diverse crustaceans. So this methane spewing mud volcano, which sounds horrible, is actually becoming a cradle of life in the Arctic Ocean inside a mud volcano. Doesn't that tell you something that maybe we don't need to be quite as worried about methane as we thought we needed to be? And remember a few shows ago, I talked about how the wetlands create methane, but they also create, I don't know, biodiversity. The wetlands create are, you know, the incubators for water, rivers and streams and beaver dams and all those wonderful things that we need in nature. And I don't think anybody's going to ever say we need to not have wetlands. In fact, the EPA is pretty darn proud of protecting the wetlands, um, as they should be. But it is really funny to me that now we're worried about methane spewing into the atmosphere when apparently in the Arctic Ocean, fish are able to take care of it just fine without us. And then the last thing, which comes into the NIMBY, not in my backyard crowd, Europeans want to have climate action and they want to have they want to control climate change except if it interrupts their lifestyles too much. So Europeans well, there was a quit there was a poll that was taken that oh yeah absolutely they're in favor of climate they're worried about the climate change crisis and they want to um, you know protect the, the world and they want to you know stop climate change and the responses though from Europe, Ukraine, France, Denmark, Sweden, Spain, and Italy said that they're happy as long as it doesn't interrupt their lifestyles. Hmm. It's a good theory, but don't make me do it at home. So oh, they didn't want to pay more for, they're not in favor of EVs. They didn't want to pay more in fuel taxes and for say, sale of petrol and diesel cars. And they also were opposed to failing, pay, paying any more taxes. And they also said that, oh, the ban on fossil fuels, well, maybe, maybe not. So it's very interesting when you're, when you're asked to really put the rubber to the road, so to speak, and actually you know, live the lifestyle that Greta Thunberg and all the other ones are telling us to do. And by the way, Bill Gates refuses to be a vegan. They, it's, like, it's a great idea until it starts coming into our lifestyle, which tells me that this whole move is not really sustainable. Now, is it? This is the KJ Show. You're on the Bold Brave TV network. I'm your host, Dr. Katherine Johnson, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. 
Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. Yes, it is a live TV show, and I always love the fact that if it works, it works. Technology is fabulous. And speaking of technology, today we're talking about how clean is my coal. Because there's been a huge movement, um, not universal by any stretch, including the federal government isn't even in favor of it. But there is some movement along with the scientists and the climatologists and the, well, the climate activists, I should say, are worried about coal and how coal is dirty and we need to have no coal. We need to eliminate coal completely from our fuel uh, generation source. But that's not quite as easy as it sounds because coal has been around since as long as mankind. In fact, uh, coal, they said, have been using heating since the caveman. And they actually, archaeologists found that the evidence that Romans in England used it in the second and third centuries to heat up their Roman baths now, I've been to hot springs heated naturally, and they're wonderful, but heating, using coal to warm up your baths is a pretty ingenious idea. And the Romans, you know, really did have some interesting ideas and great architecture. But people have been using coal all over the world for thousands of years to heat their food, to heat their home, to, for basic sanitation and hygiene. And it was used in the public baths. And the Aztec Empire liked coal so much, they actually made it a, a, a rock. They actually decorated their homes with ornaments of coal. So coal has been an essential part of humanity as long as we've had recorded history. And in the 1700s, of course, coal, we have all those memories and reading our Oliver Twist and Mary Poppins and the cold, how dusty it is and dirty it is. They, they found that they could... That, but England actually discovered that coal was better than the alternative, believe it or not, because it burned cleaner and hotter than charcoal, than wood, than burning trees, um, which we seem to now be doing again in Europe. But so wood, they were using trees to create charcoal, but that wasn't as good as coal. So coal actually was an improvement over charcoal. And having just had a barbecue, I can tell you charcoal is great for grilling my hot dogs, but not necessarily for heating my house. Coal is also the largest source of energy for generating electricity in the United States and around the world too, by the way. And it's the most abundant fossil fuel in the United States. Think about that. We wouldn't have to go anywhere outside the United States to get the energy we need to power everything we have. Coal exists in seams, you know, and they're you know, all over the country, primarily West Virginia and out West and Wyoming and Colorado and, and that they're, you know, and all, but there's also coal is located almost every continent. The largest coal reserves are in the United States, Russia, China, Australia, and India. So it's a fairly universally distributed fuel, and it's readily available, and it's critical for energy generation. As much as we've been talking about solar and wind and, and nuclear, um, coal is actually still accounting for a fair percentage of the electric generation we use. Um, coal is primarily used to produce heat, and it's the leading energy choice for most developing countries. Coal can also be used by individual households or by furnaces, you know, in, bus in businesses, boilers, those big boilers. You know what they do? They actually heat the water to create steam that creates the electricity. So it's um, very important to our power grid and our national energy supply to have coal. But, of course, people are worried about the fact that it's considered dirty and harmful. So maybe there's a notion of something called clean coal. Well, what's that? Um, by the way, coal is mined extensively in the United States, and it's coal in 25 states and three major regions. And more than one-third of the nation's coal comes from West Virginia, which is the Appalachians. So as much as the political folks in D.C., which I live 40 miles away from, want to tell us that we're going to get rid of coal. And as much as Joe Manchin is considered um, kind of a pariah for wanting to uh, represent West Virginia, 
coal mining is essential to the United States. And I'll talk even more about that in a later segment. But clean coal is something that people are trying to think, okay, maybe it doesn't have to, we don't want the, the coal, the chimney sweeps of old, you know, uh, of 1700 England. We want to have clean, clean burning coal. But what is that? Is that really even something that makes sense? And so clean coal is actually a process, a chemical process. Now, I'm not a physicist, so I don't understand, or a chemist. But apparently they wash the, the practice. They, they basically filter out some of the sulfur and they reduce the emissions of the ash and sulfur so it burns cleanly with less waste. Um, and then they use all these gadgets called precipitators and filters. They can remove 99% of the dirty part of the coal. And that the clean coal technologies can also capture and store CO2, which is you know carbon capture or carbon sequestration. I can't ever say it. Sequestering, never mind, carbon storage. Um, and that they're trying to reduce the atmospheric, you know, pollutants from coal by basically eliminating the, the pollute, most polluting par parts of it and then burying it deep in the ground so it won't actually burn into our environment or into our atmosphere. But guess what? They've actually found that clean coal works. It actually had been around for a long time and it's been, a, according to a decades of research that have discovered that clean coal, burning clean coal, reduces, um, to make electricity, actually reduces 30 to 50% increased efficiency and produces 40% 40 less, 40 less CO2. So here we have a technology that's abundant in the United States. It's cheap, it's plentiful, we don't have to go to war over it. We have 25 of our state's economies benefit from this and it's available. And, it, and we've found a way to make it less polluting and less harmful to the earth and less and, and you know and, and more efficient so it it sounds like why are we pushing away from the coal moment why are we saying that coal is such a bad idea when in fact it is actually a solution that makes sense and it's cheap it's something everybody can afford it actually makes too much sense i think so one of the problems is that even the most advanced um coal you know still produces more you know more co2 than wind or hydro but so that's the problem. Yes, it does produce pollution, but wind and hydro and solar also produce other types of pollution. So there's never going to be a clean solution to coal or to any type of energy. But I think we should start with the one that is actually literally in our backyard and look how to make that better than trying to invest in technologies that we basically rob and put, use forced labor in Africa in the lithium and cobalt mines. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm on sort of thinking coal might be a really important part of our future. In fact, I know it is. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. You're on the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. 
We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV Network. And today we're talking about how clean is my coal? And the answer is probably cleaner than you think. Um, but I'm going to talk about some of the pros and cons because I try to be objective and open-minded. I did used to be a journalist, and that's really where my first uh, first inklings of how to do research started. But for to talking about how clean is my coal, I wanted to sort of say, well, what are the pros and cons? And why are we, you know, is coal as bad as it seems? Or is coal actually a probable solution? So the, the pros are pretty obvious. It's abundant. It's here. It's literally, and it's abundant every in a lot of different places, especially places like India and China, and of course United States, the United States and Russia. And it's relatively inexpensive um, when you think about how expensive it is to connect lines to electrical v- v- grids in Scotland, and you have to cut down trees to do it. You know that is not cheap, and cutting down trees to build electrical grid lines doesn't make sense a lot to me anyway. But it's relatively inexpensive, and it's a continuous power which is something that wind and solar do not have. And it's something that, you know, engineers like to call intermittent power is, is, you know, engineers like things that run continuously, especially when you're generating electricity. It's high utilization, good load factor, all things that um, the electric engineers love. And there's an infrastructure in place, a substantial infrastructure, one that took us about 150 years to build. So I don't necessarily think abandoning coal entirely makes a lot of sense for all these reasons. It can also be made low carbon and clean with carbon storage uh, and various different types of technologies and scrubbers. So they can actually make it burn even cleaner than it does. And it can be converted to a liquid or a gas, which also burn cleaner. So it doesn't have to be used in the the coal that you think of the lump of coal in your Christmas stocking. It can actually be converted into other areas, which can then also be transferred. Clean technology is also, and this is surprising, is being used widely, widely in China. Hmm. They don't seem to be apologetic about their coal plants. In fact, they have the largest number of coal plants in the world right now, over a thousand. And guess what? They're becoming the leaders of clean coal technology because even they realize that nobody wants pollution, but we do want clean, safe, reliable burning sources for our electricity. It's also relatively low capital investment. You know, compared to having to build a nuclear plant or a gas powered plant, coal is a lot cheaper to do that. And it, you know, you don't have the same concerns like nuclear is, although it's very safe, um, cause still if there's a mess up, if there's a mess, if something happens, it's catastrophic and it's expensive and it's, you know, you have to pay a lot for that energy security. Um, of course people, and there are necessarily, you know, important on the, to be totally objective, there are some disadvantages or cons of clean coal that it's not renewable. Well, it's not renewable, except that there's such an unlimited, it's almost nearly unlimited supply of fossil fuels. Um, but they say there's a finite supply, but I think that that would be several thousand years in the future. By then we'll probably have all these other things worked out or we won't need to be worried. Coal also contains more CO2, which is bad and is contributing to global warming. Um, so people claim, um, but that's another day, another discussion. Um, that does cause environmental health, societal bis. I mean, everybody knows that coal can cause black lung disease and obviously children with asthma when they breathe it, it can you know, create lung problems. But with clean coal, that should be mitigated as well. Um, they said there's a high cost to transporting coal to power plants, but you know, we have to transport coal, um, uh, we have to transport liquid gas through pipelines. And so I don't know how, if the cost is, that much more or less than say putting it on a pipeline or you know it's great if the train assuming of course the trains don't crash um coal mining has a emitter of methane i think we've already talked about methane today and actually methane can be solved naturally and there's high levels of radiation uh, more radiation than nuclear plants which i didn't know that's kind of surprising actually but, you know, it does release some dirty things in the air, like socks and knocks, and they cause acid rain. Sequestration, see, I can say it, is expensive, and the ability to hold CO2 is unproven, so it's a new yet unproven technology. But, you know, then so is wind and solar. 
And clean coal is not carbon free. And there are, um, it can be toxic um, at certain at certain concentrations. So I mean, coal is certainly has its drawbacks, and I'm not say, pretending that it doesn't. But I'm thinking as a strategy, as we move towards a cleaner future, we have to have coal somehow in the equation. That now, ironically, the cleanest coal in the world are wait for it. There's the United States has a plant, and the, so does Japan. Japan actually has the cleanest coal in the world. They have the cleanest coal fire power plant in the world in terms of emission intensity with levels comparable to comparable to a natural gas. So there is a clean technology solution out there, and it's in Japan, who's had their own problems with nuclear, right? The International Energy Agency for Clean Coal says the utility's average emissions are in single digits for SOx and NOx at less than five milligrams, and are actually, um, they said the coal fleet in Japan is the most efficient in the world, followed by China and the EU. So here we have the International Energy Agency saying that Japan has figured out a way to do clean coal. Well, certainly we can figure it out too, or we can license it from Japan. Japan also has a young fleet, meaning, you know, some of our coal plants are old, but, you know, but then again, in China is also developing with every new power plant they build some sort of uh, particulate screen, you know, they're moving, they're doing scrubbers and other ways to get rid of the coal ash and stuff. And they're actually, China is actually subsidizing the development of clean coal technologies, China. So China faces a lot of problems, you know, expanding their coal fleet. And frankly, they need every kind of power they can get. And so now they're working on ways to develop clean technologies as a way to crack down on air pollution, which as we know in Beijing is pretty bad. Um, And they had to basically stop, you know, they had to basically stop every manufacturing in China near Beijing, up in the run-up to the Olympics. So, but China actually has gotten a government crackdown. Now, I think Chinese government crackdowns are probably quite effective. And the the country's coal-fired fleet has an operational efficiency of 37% better than most other countries. And they're averaging, um, they're actually lowering the amount of pollution. So, we have Japan and China developing clean coal technologies. And they're not waiting for any environmental rules. They're not waiting for any markets to change. They're saying we need coal because we can't rely on nuclear. Obviously, Japan had some problems with that. And China has an air pollution problem and they need power. So this is something that they're working on really intensely. And it's amazing to me. So now the new EU regulations in the United States are actually trying to require that these type, same types of clean coal technologies be used on new coal plants that are being built, and that in the United States, coal is considered, will continue to power about 21% of all electricity, about a fifth, by, even in 20, 2030, and that the most efficient coal plant in the United States is in Arkansas. So the point is, coal isn't going away. And coal is important in our energy equation. And as I say, I think we need everything. I think we need a whole diverse portfolio. We can't put all of our eggs in one basket. But clean coal is certainly a good egg to think about. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. You're on the KJ Show and the Bold Brave TV Network. And I'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening, uh, like a a flow inside, Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? 
Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back to The KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host. And today we are talking about, on the Bold Brave TV network, how clean is my coal? And one of my viewers mentioned that it does take electricity to run uh, these these coal plants. It says one problem with electrostatic precipitators is that they take electricity to run. So a lot of the facilities turn them up to the point where they barely meet EPA environment requirements and why use extra electricity to pull more out of your exhaust if you don't have to. Seems like a big lost opportunity. And I agree with you, Joel, and I certainly appreciate your insights. Again, I'm not an engineer, so... This is all kind of interesting and new to me, but I appreciate the fact that yes, we do have to use electricity to clean to clean our um, our coal, uh, clean coal to create clean coal. But then again, we have to use electricity to do a lot of different things. And I'm welcome to please call in and join the conversation or the debate. The numbers should be on your screen. Um, and I have uh, been thinking about this since I didn't get a chance to talk with you guys last week about all the different interesting activities that have been happening in the news. And a few news stories flitted across my, my desk when I was thinking about these things. And one of them is really funny. I've been talking about electric vehicles for a while now. And I talked about a few years, a few shows ago about how Ferraris, Ferrari was very, very upset about they don't want to create electric vehicles and the Italians in general are basically rallying against creating, eliminating internal combustion engines because they're Italian. Well, guess what? Ferrari has now said that they will, they are pushing back on EVs. The chief of Italian manufacturer told the BBC it would be arrogant to dictate to customers what they can buy while at the same time walking away from their country's heritage. Ferrari wants to honor its history of high-performance cars using traditional propulsion methods, and Ferrari insists it would continue to develop internal combustion engines to salute the, what the company says is an essential part of the company's heritage. Now, you know what? I really agree with that arrogance. It is arrogant to tell people that your choices that you know best. It's the nanny gate kind of thing. Well, we can't have Slurpees. That we don't. That we're human beings. We can't make up our own minds, and we're not allowed to make decisions that are, you know, that we think are bad. It's almost people are sitting in judgment of us. Kind of a lot of challenges I have with other things on the planet that talk that talk about how we should do this or we should do that. But then the people who are pushing it don't do it. For example, Bill Gates still has his private air, um, plane flying around, even though he's a big climate guy and he's buying up lots of farmland and wants to basically feed us crickets. I mean, but he won't eat them, of course. It's the same thing that happened in Animal Farm and what, you know, the whole failure of the Soviet system was when you have a few people at the top, the one percenters, who determine what the 99% of us want to do. And I don't think any time the government tells us, mandates something about a choice, do we want an internal combustion engine or do we want uh, an electric vehicle? Well, we're consumers and that's not a bad thing and let the market decide. And if the market truly decided, we wouldn't have all these EVs would be out of price range for 90% of us because the only reason that the electric vehicles are being successfully uh, sold is because there's a lot of rebates and tax rebates and even more rebates coming from the Inflation Reduction Act which ironically is creating inflation. So the problem I have is that we should have a true market system. Good ideas survive. And I think Ferrari's onto something. They're Italian. They know how they make their money. They have a good business proposition. People buy their cars. Why would they get rid of that? Um, so if you're welcome to join in the conversation, I'd love to talk to you. It's 866-451-1451. And I just read yesterday that Ford is actually going to be giving up its fight for or its thinking about going into EVs business, but it's now it's sort of saying, I don't think we can compete. And they're actually starting to step back. That was sort of a news flash. I haven't read all the details yet, but Ford is losing 
so much money on its EV divisions. And I've talked about that before. And its EV trucks don't really work. And what Ford basically has gotten, what it does, it makes a really great truck that is essential for a lot of people. Well, that's a good product. Why should we get rid of that? If that's what people need to do their jobs and their farms and their factories and their homes and their businesses, why should we be saying, no, we can't? And who's saying it? Is it people that we've elected or is it people who've sort of influenced us? And see, that's where I always kind of get into trouble. Is is it really a choice that we're making or is it more an opinion that we're trying, society is pushing us one way or the other? Try not to be political, but this is becoming very political. Um, another interesting story I came across, and I'm going to follow up on these ones for sure, is because it's too good not to. Um, so one of my future episodes will have to be on wind turbines, and it'll be something like blowing in the wind or something, because um, guess what? Giant wind turbines are falling over, and no one knows why. Oh, so yeah, this is a technology I want to put my future in, right? And when wind turbines fall over, bad things happen. First of all, they're huge. And I've already spoken about the problems of wind turbines are built so well, they're hard to recycle. And they are basically recyclable proof because they're so durable. It's, it's, kind, it's a problem with the, with the waste of the blades. But according to Bloomberg, who would, I wouldn't necessarily say is a conservative media outlet at all, wind turbine failures are increasing in Oklahoma, Sweden, Colorado, and Germany with all three of the major manufacturer problems admitting that they have a problem. That they have, in a way, in, in their race to build good turbines, guess what? They're not being manufactured as efficiently as they should be, or as their quality control is basically down. Uh, production issues are to blame. Turbines are also growing larger, but the quality control is getting smaller. <laughs> that seems like an inverse and a paradox to me. I mean, certainly if you're building a larger airplane, wouldn't you want to have better quality control, not less? And certainly if you're building a large wind turbine, wouldn't you want to make sure that the blades worked and the thing didn't fall down and kill a bunch of cows in the process? So that's what happens. Wind turbines fall down, they electrocute cows, they decapitate people. I mean, it's a terrible thing when they fall. So multiple turbines taller than 750 feet are collapsing worldwide with the tallest 784 feet falling in Germany in September 2021. How can we never hear about these things? We talk about offshore wind and we talk about wind turbine as a solution, except of course in Martha's Vineyard where they, you know, kill birds and block the views. Um, but the point is that we're building wind turbines. Again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, aren't we? In the rush to put in new technologies, we're failing to do the proper quality control and quality inspection. The turbines, by the way, these turbines are taller than the Space Needle in Seattle or the Washington Monument. Well, in all fairness, the Washington Monument isn't that tall um, because you, D.C., thank God, has a building limit and their buildings cannot be taller than the Washington Monument, which is one of the reasons D.C. is such a beautiful city with not a lot of skyscrapers, which is great. But the Space Needle is pretty tall. I've been in it. It's, it's pretty high. And to think about um, the wind turbines falling, that would be quite a catastrophic event. Smaller turbines are also falling. In Oklahoma, Wales, Wisconsin, Colorado, the ones about the height of the Statue of Liberty. So maybe there's something to be learned here. Maybe there's a height restriction on wind turbines. Or maybe the manufacturers just need to get their act together. Um, what they're finding out is that their Siemens, the three major manufacturers of wind turbines, have all had um, problems with manufacturing. They've had uh, delays. GE has warranty costs and repairs, and this is combined with the supply chain issues, has created fluctuating material pricing and obviously not good quality control. So clearly wind turbines, and I'll be talking about this more in the future, are another strategy that maybe we're not quite ready for uh, prime time. But you're on the KJ Show. You've been watching Dr. KJ Johnson, Katherine Johnson, myself, on the Volbray TV network, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? 
Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV Network. And you can still dial in if you'd like to talk to me, 866-451-1451. Today I've been talking about how clean is your coal. And it's been a debated topic for quite a while, especially in the energy industry that I work in. I'm sure I'm not making friends today. But I have to tell you, guess what? The Department of Energy is actually way ahead of the curve on this one. And they believe clean coal is crucial for American jobs, energy security, and national supply chains. Now, I wonder why I don't hear that from our Department of Energy Secretary, Ms. Grantham. But apparently the DOE has the Energy Technology Laboratory, National Energy Technology Laboratory. Guess where it's based? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, coal mining capital probably, one of the most you know, Pennsylvania in general is pretty heavy coal mining. Well, they're actually doing research on how to create more clean coal plants with pollution controls. Makes perfect sense to me, and I'm glad the DOE is doing research on things that actually make sense by they reducing nitrous oxidize, I'm sorry, they're reducing NOx by 83%, sulfur dioxide by 98%, and particulate matter by almost 100%. So the, the DOE is actually doing research into clean coal. So I'm not that far off the mark. In fact, coal, coal's high carbon content makes it an ideal feedstock, wait for this, for various high value materials, making it's the source of fuel to build steel, carbon fiber, building materials, and it's hydrogen. So coal even if it's not used to generate electricity, is critically important in manufacturing things that we need. And they also think at the National Energy Technology Laboratory in Pittsburgh that coal is viewed as a critical bridge fuel. Now, this is the first time I've seen this, and this is exactly what we need to be talking about. Why this isn't in the mainstream press kind of concerns me, and why in my industry, where we're talking about energy efficiency, which is critically important, we are talking about clean coal as much as we're talking about electric vehicles and solar and wind and things that, and heat pumps, which have you know some, some challenges as well. But according to the National Energy Technology Lab, in the next 30 years, coal production will be between 145 to 345 million tons. Doesn't sound like it's going anywhere, does it? And it's gonna go create 47,000 jobs. Now coal miners, rightly so, get paid a lot of money. These are good paying jobs and they're not all gonna get iron lung. I mean, it's been, our, it's been a lot better than we've had black lung. A lot, that, excuse me, it's been a lot better than it was say in the 70s and even in the 1700s, 1800s when coal mining was a dirty, dangerous job. It's still dangerous, but it's gotten a lot cleaner and safer and a lot better um, safety records. In fact, I went to the largest coal plant in Karuna, Sweden, and it was amazing how light it, how well lit it was, how much safety precautions there were, how there was, you know, 
fire extinguishers and oxygen and first aid kits and everything. I mean, it's a much more modern, clean and safe environment than it was, say, 300 years ago. Carbon products could actually result in values manufacturing of $139 billion and 480,000 manufacturing jobs. So we're going to create 47,000 good coal mining jobs and 48,000 manufacturing jobs for coal products. Why are we thinking that this is a thing to get rid of? And now the Department of Energy has a new initiative called Coal First, which will lay the groundwork for to make tomorrow's coal plants by call, making them flexible, innovative, resilient, small, and transformative. And our goal is that the coal will become emissions free. You know what? I have a feeling that the Energy Department of Energy can work on that and probably can figure that out. But again, it doesn't get the press because clean coal is considered a dirty business. And, and all, there's a lot of political will and a lot of political money towards the other types of fuels, unfortunately. So, and the other thing is that renewables really aren't enough to generate the electricity that we need. And I've been saying this for a long time, that coal supplies 40% right now of the United of the world's electricity needs. And it's going to be increasing. And more than, say, China, 75% of China's electricity comes from coal, including manufacturing our cell phones and um, our iPhones and all the one things that we, you know, all the things that American people love. That's manufactured from coal. Why no one ever says that? And they talk about how wonderful Apple is. You have to think about, look back at the value, sub chain. I've been talking about this before, but coal is too low cost too plentiful and available from reliable sources to be replaced, says a fuel analyst. I love that. Too low cost, plentiful and reliable. And there's something wrong with that? I don't think so. Um, and China is putting in solar and wind power at a tremendous pace, but they will still have to use more and more coal to keep up with the demand. So yes, coal can be part of the energy solution. I love the notion of a bridge fuel. And there's also important to carbon sequestration um, that they believe you can do that. To, it's vital to the climate. I agree. Nobody wants pollution. And, and Schwarzenegger was right. Climate change isn't the issue. It's pollution. And no one wants that. But Stephen Chu, who used to be the Department of Energy, um, when I think it was during Trump's administration, he's a Nobel winning physicist. He was a, a U.S. Secretary of Energy. He says, I don't see how we're going to go forward without coal. Now, I think a nuclear Nobel winning physicist probably understands the importance of coal. And he says... Our dependence on coal isn't ending anytime soon, although renewable energy is expected to boom, it will remain forever the top power source. So um, amazingly, it's going to continue. We're not going anywhere. In fact, energy experts believe it will take at least a century before modern societies can convert to renewable energy, another 100 years. And until then, they will have to have carbon capture and storage is the only way to deal with the you know, carbon, it's it's the only way to deal with the carbon dioxide pollution, but it's also going to be, we're not going to be really getting rid of coal anytime soon. For decades to come, fossil fuels will be very important because it will be needed as a backup and because they are vital to making steel, fertilizer, and cement. Carbon capture will inevitably be part of the renewable energy grid, but coal isn't going anywhere. So how clean is my coal? A lot cleaner than you think. And I think with the DOE and its research that it's doing, it's going to be even cleaner. And maybe it should be considered not this horrible back black thing, but actually a bridge fuel to fuel the next energy transition. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. You're on the Bold Brave TV network. You've been watching the KJ Show, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author 
radio show host and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I wanted to take this section for some personal reflections. It was Memorial Day on Monday. And um, it's a very important holiday to my family because my father, H. Clifford Lee, was actually named for Harold Clifford Lee, his uncle, who was killed in France in 1918 um, and was considered one of Pershing's 100 best men. When I took my epic trip last year with my fa- in November with my family, I was fortunate and able to go and visit his grave where he's buried. Um, he was just 20, 22 years old in the, these beautiful fields of France. And it, to me, it's, you know, I've always sort of wondered how, how much sacrifice these young men made, and women too, but primarily in World War, in these battles, it was men, young men, uh, teenagers, the early 20s. And what I'd always heard is because my grandfather, his younger brother, loved his older brother Harold so much that he named my father after him and he also kept his memory alive so growing up I would hear about Uncle Harold and his deeds of bravery and we'd also have the American Legion post is named after him in his hometown in Minnesota and lastly um, when I was about 15 we came across these beautiful letters that Harold had written to his mother now Harold was going to be a minister and he apparently was a fine orator just like his father just like his brother my, my grandfather but also what he really wanted to do was his bit. And I came across some really interesting historical write-up about my Uncle Harold, my great Uncle Harold. And he's great in a lot of ways. Um, he represented, um, he wrote poems, uh, and he basically said, insight into the manner of his army duties given by members of his own unit was after the armistice, he met with the men of Company A who told him that Lee was very anxious to get into the hottest places when the company was in reserve. And he wanted to go with other companies which were in the thick of the fight. Nothing seemed to bother him. And when one of the boys was wounded, he alone carried him back to the dressing station. He was willing to do anything for his fellow soldiers. And one day he volunteered to get the chow. And as he was crossing a field, a 77-inch motor hit him, and that's how he died. The fellows I talked to seemed anxious and willing to talk about Harold. And how at every opportunity he helped everyone best he could and exposed himself for everyone's safety. And there was a glow and pride and reverence for the facts that, you know, he was brave and he did his bit. He actually wrote a poem, and I, I'm trying to find it, but he actually wrote a poem that says that he was in the reserve, he was in the billet guard, and he wanted to go and be in the fight. He volunteered, he enlisted in, you know, 1917, he was made a corporal less than a year later, so he must have been a very good soldier. And he actually, in the letters that he wrote home to his family, talked about how he wanted to come back and be a minister and how much he was praying for these brave men he was serving with and what a privilege and an honor it was to serve his country. And this is just one small snippet of all of the millions of people in Americans, especially that we need to remember on Memorial Day. It's not just about barbecues and, and you know fun times at the beach, but these are men and women who have given so much, the ultimate sacrifice. And I always take them in my family, we always take a minute during Memorial Day or a couple hours actually and talk about what service means and what heroic service means and how much we are grateful for Uncle Harold. My son, who is studying to be a minister, he's just finished seminary and is now training to be a chaplain, has Uncle Harold's Bible and he reads it and he uses it. And I'm thinking that part of Uncle Harold lives on in my son's wishes to serve his country and his and his in devotion to his God. And I think Uncle Harold would be very proud. And I'm very proud of all of the heroes, those who are laid to rest in those beautiful cemeteries in France and in the United States and all across the country, all across the world. 
One of the nice things when I went to his funeral, his grave in France was, Harold was buried with his friends. There's a lot of other 20-year-old boys from Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa and California he died with, and he's there with them. And that gave me comfort. And the battlefields are taken care of, and that gives us great comfort. So we honor our veterans. We honor our, those who fell in the service and thank them so much for their service. Thank you, Uncle Harold. I'm Katherine Johnson, Dr. KJ Show. You've been watching on the Bold Brave TV Network, and next week I'll have another fun idea. And thanks so much for joining us. Come back next week. This has been the KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares her insights to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here on the KJ Show.